This week on The Change Law, we're talking with Daniel Thompson about Towery and their journey to the recent 1.0 release. Towery is often compared to Electron. It is a toolkit that lets you build software for all major desktop operating systems using web technologies. It was built for the security-focused, privacy-respecting, and environmentally conscious software engineering community. Whew, that's a lot to build for. The core libraries are written in Rust, and the UI layer can be written using virtually any front-end framework. On today's show, we get into all the details, why Rust, how the project was formed, their resistance thus far to venture capital, their full commitment to the freedom virtues of open source, and all the technical bits you need to know to consider for your next multi-platform project. For our loyal listeners out there who want to skip the ads and get a little closer to the metal, check out ChangeLaw++. That's our membership, changelaw.com slash plus plus. Sadly, there is no bonus content for plus plus subscribers today, but we have started to ship a special Monday news edition of the pod for everyone. If you're a subscriber, all you have to do is sit back and enjoy those extras. And if you're not subscribed, hit the changelaw.fm for all the ways. A massive thanks to our friends and partners at Fastly. Bandwidth for ChangeLog is provided by Fastly. Check them out at Fastly.com. This episode is brought to you by Honeycomb. Find your most perplexing application issues. Honeycomb is a fast analysis tool that reveals the truth about every aspect of your application in production. Find out how users experience your code in complex and unpredictable environments. Find patterns and outliers across billions of rows of data and definitively solve your problems. And we use Honeycomb here at ChangeLaw. That's why we welcome the opportunity to add them as one of our infrastructure partners. In particular, we use Honeycomb to track down CDN issues recently, which we talked about at length on the Kaizen edition of the Ship It podcast. So check that out. Here's the thing. Teams who don't use Honeycomb are forced to find the needle in the haystack. They scroll through endless dashboards playing whack-a-mole. They deal with alert floods, trying to guess which one matters. And they go from tool to tool to tool playing sleuth, trying to figure out how all the puzzle pieces fit together. It's this context switching and tool sprawl that are slowly killing teams' effectiveness and ultimately hindering their business. With Honeycomb, you get a fast, unified, and clear understanding of the one thing driving your business, production. With Honeycomb, you guess less and you know more. Join the swarm and try Honeycomb free today at honeycomb.io slash changelog. Again, honeycomb.io slash changelog. So we have Daniel here from Tari, or is it Tauri or Tori? Help us out, Daniel. How do you say it? Well, you know, it's uh, it's all up to you. I think that in our community, there's a lot of people who have different opinions about how to say it, and we always kind of just go with whatever people want to say. Okay. Personally, when I'm using it in a sentence, I would say Tauri is this, that, or the other thing. So for me, it's Tauri. For Lucas, I think he says more Tauri with a little bit of an O. Yeah. For Yue, it's maybe Tauri with a longer O, but I mean, it's just a name. If you put me in a vacuum and said pronounce this, I would probably an- pronounce it like Atari without the A. Tauri. That's probably less accurate than the way either of you are doing it, but I'm happy to call it Tauri. Well, what about the star Centauri? Alpha Centauri. How would you say that? Centauri. Yeah. Same thing. Tari. <laughs> That's actually where we took the name from. It's from these binary stars. Yeah, it's the binary stars. So, you know, you've got this core or back end and you've got the front end and that's kind of the design impulse behind it. And we just kind of went with it. And if you look at our logo, you'll actually see that the uh, the blue part and the orangey yellow part are very close to a very certain star. Okay. I'll leave it to you to find out. Very cool. I thought it was like a cell dividing. That was my interpretation it was like cell division it's also two people hugging <laughs> lots of interpretations here adam how do you say centaur centaur i would say like a centaur would be like centaur and i would say alpha centauri like alpha centauri like atari yeah, yeah so we're totally. together atari. of course we're both midwesterners here yeah danielle's over there in malta but also originally from the states yeah i uh i grew up there went to college there and then 
left in uh, 2000. So a longtime expat now living in Malta. I like the the logo being after the the two stars because I'm I'm a a known person to know about space and stars and astronomy and whatnot, but I hadn't looked at Alpha Centauri in a while, and it's two stars. Well played, guys. Well played. You know that that whole three body problem thing is also kind of cool if you think about it. Like, you know the the all of these possibilities of the user and the app and the front end and the back end and how it's just. Uh, recombinatorial in so many different ways that i don't know it just seemed like that kind of fixed tidal gravitation was an, a nice visual acoustic uh idea uh, metaphor for it mm. yeah if you look at the at the blank space the non space it's actually also an infinity sign right dun, dun, yeah dun, dun. kind of pretty close <laughs> it's either a sideways eight or the, or the number eight leaning over <laughs> That's right. Mm-hmm. A lot of depth to this. I think you guys have thought it through as the point that we're we're getting to yeah. where you got very lucky with a very cool logo and a name that's unique but hard to say for people around the world depending on your dialect. I like that though. I mean, the name it, it makes it challenging in some cases, I guess, if you're trying to say, "Hey, go check out Tari." Well, you go to Tari app. Well, how do you spell Tari? Right. Well, you may spell it differently cuz you may be thinking of a Tari. A T A R R I, I believe, is how you spell Atari. So you may go just to T A R R I as an example versus T A U R I dot app. So it does make directing people to the brand somewhat challenging whenever you have a challenging name to pronounce. Tough question. What's the best circle constant? <laughs> <laughs> Tough question. Yeah, it's a tough question. <laughs> what do you think? I would say Tau. I would. I would. I'm. I'm a Tau club fanboy. Okay. Just less division, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. <laughs> how much division is involved? Well, I mean, two pi r isn't that how you calculate the area of a circle? But if you know Tau, you don't need to do two times something. You just have it. I like how he 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 drops that and then he just takes a long pause and takes a drink of his drink while we just sit here and think <laughs> about it. Okay. Very nice. Well, you're a deep thinker, Daniel. Maybe go deep with us on the origin of Towery because you've been working on the wild. It's 1.0 now, but that was even after a very long nine-month beta. So I'm assuming it took more than nine months to get to here since you had a nine-month beta. Give us the backstory, why you created this project, who's involved, et cetera. Oh, gosh. Well, we've been working on it for you know just over three years now since May. And it goes back to a different open source project that I was involved in. My friends and I, we were, we were working on a project called Quasar, which is a, a Vue.js system for building you know, websites and spas and SSR apps and Electron apps and Cordova apps. And I was always kind of interested in outreach and getting into other ecosystems. And I reached out to the wonderful people over at Purism. Um, they make this pure OS open source conform system. I mean, the, the company is, 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 is following these ideas of open source and the products are following these ideas. And I thought, well, Hey, maybe I can stop over there and, um, and ask if it's, possible for us to figure out a way to work together and we start putting some of these quasar apps on their app store and and they're like oh cool that's awesome so how are they made and i was like well you know we use vue.js and electron and they're like whoa (laughs) we can't um here's a long thread over at the fsf and read through about ungoogled chromium and why some header files aren't appropriate. I was like, okay. So three days later and and miles of threads later, it was kind of clear that, you know, what I thought open source was, wasn't always what open source really was. And just saying that something is open source and putting it on GitHub doesn't mean it really fulfills the needs of the floss community, right? The, 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 I guess the difference between free Libra open source software and open source software and open core software is that everyone kind of has these different feelings about how, how you enable other people to use your code. And at any rate, and as fate would have it kind of dejected 
couple of days later, uh, a really good friend said, hey, did you check out the WebView library? And I was like, oh, okay, well, fine. I'll go look at it. And uh, this was like a, a combination of projects. There was a, a developer named Z Serge who wrote a bunch of C and Objective-C bindings for the platform-specific web views on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And then we found a Rust port. And so we did a first uh, practice, Lucas and I, with Go. And then I think, I think I did the first C example, and then Lucas did Go, and we're both like, this isn't really nice. And then we found the Rust library. Um, the Rust library kind of helped us and allowed us to get to a kind of proof of concept really quickly. And... You know, what we were seeing was kind of this, like, Daniel, Lucas said, uh, are, is this right? Like, the app's only two megabytes. And, and you know, we've been using Electron apps and are used to things weighing 600, 700 megabytes in the download. Mm -hmm. And, okay, it was, it was just a dot app, you know. It, it wasn't like all of the crazy MSI installers and a DMGs and don't get me started on the Linuxes, but it was kind of tangible and real. And we were both really new to Rust, like totally <laughs> uh, unaware of the complexities of the stuff we were getting ourselves into. And we had these proof of concepts. We got it working on Mac and we got it working on Linux and we got it working on Windows. And that's kind of the time when I think we got slash dotted. Oh, no, we, we got hacker newsed first. And it was kind of the, this almost raging, how dare you not ship Chromium? And, and it, 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 was, it was interesting because it kind of gave us an uptake and it gave us uh, some, some visibility to the larger community. And then just one after the other, these amazing people joined us who really believed in, yeah, we can make it more energy efficient. We can make it more secure, and we can really follow in these open source ideals and, you know, do our best and stay transparent and accountable. And, you know, things went, went pretty well. We got further and further, and then boom, COVID happened. And, and I think, you know, for, for those of us who were around and active in software and especially open source, it kind of got to be, I don't know. I mean, I know personally I had a, a just this like crazy experience of not knowing when to stop. And that kind of led to this weird COVID burnout. And we we're all just like, oh my gosh, all right. So the world's ending. Let's go have a barbecue. And, <laughs> and you know, things kind of got back on track. And um, then, you know, the investors started like ringing the doorbell. And, uh, you know, the, the venture capitalists who will remain unnamed. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with open source software becoming commercialized, but it scared me because I've been working in open source projects for like almost two decades. And I didn't want this project to become corrupted by some kind of capital that starts dictating the direction it has to take. And, you know, we kind of ghosted the first VCs to call us and went into overdrive and registered Towery as a program within the Commons Conservancy, which is a Dutch organization around NLNet that really exists to support open source projects and protect them, and especially to protect the code and to protect the community. I mean, we've all heard of Bus Factor, but, you know, I think that the ability for money to to corrupt ideas such that the original vision gets lost. I mean, I'm not saying that's the kind of militarization of open source that I'm most worried about, but for our project, we really wanted to keep it in the hands of the community. And I think that that was really the right decision at the time because, you know, as, as time went on, we got really close. You know, we, we built our betas and then we decided to get audited, right? Um, <laughs> which is a little silly. I mean, who are we? It's just some friends and an open source project. And then, you know, we, we got some grant funding and we took our donations together and we had an external horizontal audit of all of the libraries and a vertical audit of an example app. 
And I have to tell you, if you've never had your code audited, it can be scary. But I think what we all learned from the experience is that it's really exciting when your presumptions are challenged and you get to a point where you realize through the help of the external pen testers or auditors or code reviewers or whatever it is you want to call them, that you can actually continue to make your thing better. And, you know, we, we obviously published the finding after we did six months of work uh, rebuilding the parts that were problematic. And yeah, and, and now here we are a couple weeks post uh, 1.0 launch. And it's so exciting to see the gravitas of the future in the team because, you know, up till now, we, we do have a change log that we, you know, implemented in probably the first six months so that we can maintain the history of what we've built. But now you have other concerns like what parts do we have to audit next and what is our release strategy going to be? How are we going to branch this? And it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting to see the working group come together. And Well, it's a journey for sure into your story. I think what stands out to me really is your, is your desire to be true to what you consider open source roots to be. And we've covered all the aspects. And you're right, money can corrupt things. It can also inject a lot of capital for the good. So there are both sides that I'm, it's interesting to see how you were, you know, can't recall the words you used, like afraid or, you know, it, you got fear from the, the VCs coming. Like what was the, the word you had said there about your, your feelings, but just how it can corrupt things. And that's one thing I'm taking away from this intro really is just how you, how this journey has been and how the possibility of venture capital being able to corrupt that. Cause that you also have a governance model in place. You have, not only do you have that, you have like a, what's it called? A social contract. So like you've done some things to like put faith into the community and your trust in the community. So that's definitely evident. What's your personal end goal with this project? You personally? That's a longer story. Um, <laughs> Give us a TLDR. So, I mean, I'm a short filmmaker. That's where I come from. You know, I graduated uh, in the fine arts from Bauhaus University, and my thesis project was a real-time analog holographic projection system that I built from scratch, including five video projectors back in 2004. And I've always been a filmmaker. It's how I started my studies in the U.S. And for me, thinking about new ways of collaboration for my filmmaker community is... I got into Quasar because I liked the ideas behind it, but as I got deeper into it, I realized it needs a testing framework, and so I built that. And it's kind of like the deeper I go down this rabbit hole of having the perfect tech, the deeper I have to continue going. And, you know, I, I think that for me, finding that zen is when there's no more tools left to make, when I'm unable to you know, find a better way to do something when my, my friends and my community and my partners and the businesses I'm involved in all say, well, guys, we did it. Then, you know, you'll find me in my studio making films because mm -hmm. I, you know, I kind of, I, I tried to follow my principles and did my best to make the world a better place. But ultimately, honestly, I've been scratching my own itch. You know, if, if yeah. something isn't working, why isn't it working? Can I fix it? If I can't fix it, can I build something better? Is it really truly better? I don't know. Can I build something better than the other thing that we, that we built? And, you know, that's for me the end goal. As a, as a tool maker, as an, as an artist, as a communicator, I think that the path is the goal. But I don't know, end game. Gosh, mm -hmm. it's hard to say. Could you do both? I mean, it was going to be an and or or. Can you make films and pursue this pursuit? Absolutely. That's uh, actually what I'm doing next week in Malta. I'm shooting a series of short films. Nice. Nice. The reason I asked that question is because it helps me understand why the fear of VC was there. And why, it, because the question is like, well, where are you trying to take this thing? And your answers are all beauty, art, perfection, curiosity, community, relationships, perfection. I already said that one. Twice. But they're very much, these are intangible artistic things mm -hmm. that aren't like, well, I want to have 
everybody using this to build their desktop applications or, you know, like I'm sure that's probably maybe a piece of one aspect of it, but it's just, I'm trying to understand. I agree. There's the balance of the needs of the humans working on the project and the goals of the project and how that can be dangerous depending on who's involved. Right now we are collaborating with a couple wonderful people from the servo project and are working on retrofitting servo to become a web view provider for Tauri. And where we think this could go might be a truly secure and privacy respecting browser. Maybe that's as far as I can think. It's a massive undertaking. It will require enormous amounts of capital that will probably have to come from VCs and the European Commission and mm -hmm. places like that. You know, I, I, I would like to backtrack a little bit to this point in time where the VCs started contacting us. We weren't ready as an organization. We weren't mature enough as a group to even consider those those things as possible. Sure. We didn't want to take capital until we knew we had a product like a 1.0. And we might be taking capital in the near future and we might be starting a company. Um, it's a it's a group decision and there are some possibilities out there that are really exciting. And I'm just so glad we didn't go down that path too early mm -hmm. because I think from what I've seen in you know the investment world and the venture capital world, when you go in too early, I think what you sacrifice is a little bit of backbone and knowing where you come from, what it is you're doing, where you're going. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, taking a, a massive amount of cash for, for a young group can also poison relationships and make things challenging. And, and you know, I, I think after three years, it's something, you know, we're going to be looking at. Mm -hmm. well, I think that's fair and wise, especially when you're trying to figure out who you are as a group. Yeah money makes things more complicated. Now, a lack of money can also make things very complicated. Like, hey, I can't work on Towery today because I have to go do a day job or whatever it is. Do my thing, yeah. You know, so these are different trade-offs that people make. You want to give the quick nutshell of what Towery is as it exists today because we're assuming the listener has some context, which I hope they have, but may they not have. So just lay it on the table, what Towery is at a, as a 1.0. Sure. Today, Towery is a framework that lets you create desktop applications for the major OSs. And I'm counting Linux under the major OSs because there's about a dozen there. And it does so by leveraging kind of the best of both worlds of software engineering. So People who are familiar with building front ends and GUIs with web tools like, uh, I don't know, Vue and uh, React and Angular and Vite and all of these great crazy tool chains that allow you to compose JavaScript in a higher level language like .svelte or TypeScript and render out basically HTML, JS, and CSS, which gives you as a visual designer, a, a user experience designer, builder, the opportunity to, you know, leverage the best parts of the browser, which, you know, are, are styling and theming and in some cases performance. While on the back end, what you have is a highly tuned core, like an engine, if you will, that is built on Rust and only ever ships the pieces of the project that you really need. And I guess as opposed to shipping an entire Node.js runtime, one of the ways we get smaller is we only ship those code points that you actually need for your app. And, you know, it's not necessary for you to even know Rust. You can just consume the APIs, you know, you do a little configuration file that's all documented and you can consume those APIs for Towery in JavaScript and the API I call passes a string message to the Rust core and the Rust core then responds uh, depending on what you want to do. You may want to open a new window or visit a website or send a notification. And 
while a lot of these things are possible in the browser, by putting this core system interface behind the confines of relatively safe Rust, what ends up happening is that this kind of barrier between the two systems provides a greater degree of uh, operational security. And in a nutshell, Towery provides a bundler that allows you to create versions of your app that are then uh, compatible for the platform upon it which was built. You can also use our open source GitHub action to compile for all of your platforms. And we also provide a updater system so that you can basically publish an update to your update service and all of the apps that are online and listening will download an update. Sounds trivial, but it's uh, along with package management, maybe one of the more important parts of modern software. Towery also offers a plugin system so that you can enhance the features and functionality of your app above and beyond what it is the core offers, such as uh, a YubiKey integration. So there's a Rust library that integrates with the YubiKey, and you can send a message from the user interface to the Rust core to say, hey, authenticate me, please. And then the Rust core negotiates all of that then with the YubiKey. And that, that, that's just one example. I mean, there's lots of other things that, that people have been building and that we also manage for the plugin ecosystem. And maybe the coolest innovation that we have is an isolation pattern. Uh, the pattern was built in response to one of the audit findings, which more or less showed that our bridge between the front end and the back end can be corrupted in the case of illicit code running in the browser. And so what this isolation service does is it only allows API commands that are authentic to run through the bridge. There's a wonderful write-up by the author, uh, Chip, member of the core team, who it goes into great length to explain the backdrop of it. But th the important thing is it is now possible to secure the front end and back end communication against illicit injection or XSS or CSS attacks or SVG attacks or whatever. Nice. So you have these three aspects of your philosophy. I think you're speaking to the security aspect uh, through that cool innovation. Yes. Uh, you also focus on privacy. This is from the 1.0 blog post. You have the security, privacy, and then the environmental impact, which is an interesting way to think about what most of us developers tend to think about first and have the environment as an afterthought is performance. You put the environment first and have the performance be kind of the afterthought. I kind of like that casting. But here you're speaking to the app size, I assume the CPU cycles required, et cetera, is your other third aspect. Well, the, the interesting part about shipping less code is there's less possibilities for gadget attacks to be introduced. So by shipping less code, you kind of fulfill the environmental aspect as well as the security aspect. Mm -hmm. Now, with regard to the privacy aspect, this has a lot to do with the fact that we are working on helping younger engineers learn how to do things. And what I've noticed in my, I don't know how many years on help desks, is that the tooling has gotten amazing. The developer experience is so great that you don't even have to know what you're doing anymore and you can make and ship an app. And where we're trying to, it sounds terrible, and we're not trying to educate people about doing things the right way, but we're more interested in fostering an environment for engineers to reconsider their perceived ideas about how software has to be developed. It's not free real estate. <laughs> I mean, just the number of applications running massive bloated binaries and consuming transit resources is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. And by developing from a secure perspective where 
the things you build are always secure. It's not, oh, I'm building a developer app and it's only going to be for insiders in my company. We try to take the other approach and say, yeah, you may take shortcuts, but you're making yourself vulnerable. And so by kind of cementing these principles into what it is we do and how we talk about it, it's, it's really our hope that we're able to present not only a framework for making better apps, but ultimately a community that's more aware of the fact that the planet is burning, that every single thing that you can do to help that is so important. Even if you don't think it's much, every little act helps. And, and I'm really not greenwashing here. I mean, I live in Malta. It's 42 degrees. Um, we have floods everywhere on the planet, except where there's no floods <laughs> and there's no water and there's no basins. Yeah. And I'm not saying that smarter software is going to solve these problems. Smarter engineers will. And that's the next generation. And, you know, to come back to your question, maybe that is the end game. Because literally the week before we released the 1.0 of Tauri, Explorer got retired and so did Adam Shell. And software projects like, like Tauri, like Adam, like Explorer, they have a shelf life. At a certain point, the next thing comes along and, hey, maybe Tauri is able to continue evolving. Maybe not. But what we can help people do is think about what it is they're doing, why they're doing it, and offer them a framework for thinking about better ways of doing things. Mm. That reminds me of our conversation we had with Jessica Lord last fall about Electron and her work on Electron and how it changed the game and allowed so many more people to develop cross-platform apps that otherwise wouldn't have been able to because so much investment both in education and just time in building the same app for these different platforms. I'm sure you know that quite well at this point, building a, an application like Tauri that people build upon. And she said, I was asking her about how she feels when people hate on Electron on the internet, which is something that we do on the internet is we hate on Electron. And she said the haters have a good reason to say the stuff that they're saying because it's got a lot of warts. It has a lot of problems. And one of the problems that it has are these large hundreds of megabyte application bundles that are produced with Electron apps. And she said at that time, like somebody, maybe it's the Electron team, but somebody needs to come out and innovate and change. And the next thing at some point will take over or will augment or challenge Electron to change the way they do things. Now, if it's completely built around Chromium versus not, that's the kind of a foundational aspect of a technology, it seems. And so maybe a, a difficult pivot for Electron at this point. But Tauri definitely, I think, is well positioned because of these very small app sizes that you all produce mm -hmm. to change the game once again and allow better cross-platform apps to be built. The smallest app size that I know of was 450 kilobytes for a functional Hello World Mac OS app. Hmm. Granted, the, the ICNS, the icon file for Mac, if you do your, if you play it right, the, the icon is generally the largest piece of your code base. I was going to say, they like to have nice big icon files. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, there's your 700, 800 kilobytes right there. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> and the code that we need to build the app is 300 kilobytes. If you write solid, tight, minified JavaScript and you use SVGs. Right. You know, and, and you do like the awesome parts of Rust compression, then you can absolutely get down to two, three megabytes for a small app. Mm -hmm. For massive apps, okay, sure, there's maybe a bit more JavaScript, and then it's eight or nine megabytes. But even then, one of the, the nice features that I really wish Electron would figure out that we offer is that, you know, we don't ship the blank JavaScript, you know, because the ASAR file that uh, is shipped with Electron is basically the entire code to build the app. And because of the way that Tauri, you know, it doesn't use a web server. We, we use a, a custom protocol. So there's no extra ports flying around. And because of the way that the entire bundle is crafted, you can, I, I suppose you can, you can introspect some strings in a hex editor, but 
recompiling it is a master class in, uh, in reversing. It's not like, um, you know, somebody posting on Reddit, oh, I copied all your code and I made a fake app, you know? And <laughs> I think for, for the security conscious out there, you know, we understand that nothing is perfect, but every opportunity that you have to slow down an attacker and make it hard for them, the less interest they are going to have in breaking into your app and, you know, hacking around. Obviously, everything is hackable. I mean, I'm, I'm on a computer right now and it's hackable. I, I use a phone. It's software with hardware and, you know, storage devices. It's hackable. Mm -hmm. But doing our best is better than making excuses, I think. And we try to really, you know, not just say that we're secure or more secure, depending on who you talk to, but we back it up with the audit. And I, I guess that's the, the big thing from the 1.0 is that the 1.0 was audited and we resolved all of the issues that were found. This episode is brought to you by Influx Data, the makers of InfluxDB. Increasingly, time series data is all around us. It's in the cloud as applications and services scale out. It's in IoT as more and more devices come online. Sensor data is time series data, and that's exactly where InfluxDB comes into play. InfluxDB is the open source time series data platform that allows developers to build and to integrate applications with time as a foundational component. InfluxDB is made for developers to build real-time applications quickly and at scale, and they keep improving their platform to build those applications with less time and less code. Recently, they launched their Edge data replication feature. This new capability is built into the 2.2 open source version. It allows developers to replicate data from local instances into InfluxDB Cloud, enables users to aggregate and store data for long-term management and analysis, and to satisfy regulations. It brings the horsepower closer to the sensor and gives developers and solution builders the ability to leverage their own elastic compute resources deployed at the edge. Edge data replication lets you decide strategically what data moves from edge to cloud, how the data should be enriched and formatted. Add to this, InfluxDB has ongoing efforts to unify APIs across all its database offerings. They now provide a path to build once and deploy time series applications anywhere. Learn more about InfluxDB and this new feature at influxdata.com slash changelog. Again, influxdata.com slash changelog. So we talked about these three pillars of, I guess, your, you know, your philosophy, the tower philosophy, security, privacy, and environment, just to remind the listeners. But performance isn't in there, although it's kind of like part of the future of the web or any sort of application like this to be performant. But imagine that smaller file sizes lean towards performance for obvious reasons, like it downloads faster, it installs faster, it probably runs faster, less, less to load into memory, but yet the word performance didn't make it into your philosophy. Why did it, is it just baked into all three or just the grand vision or is it just missing? Sometimes we do call the apps high performance and there are bottlenecks. And in my experience with projects using Tauri, it really comes down to who is doing the architecture? What kind of architectural paradigms are they familiar with and comfortable with? And I, as an example, uh, you can use, you know, the, the crypto library from JavaScript to create a random number. And it'll take a couple cycles. It's JavaScript. It's still pretty fast. You can do the same calculation in Rust. And it might be slower because you have to pass a message to have that performed and then return the result across the bridge. But for me, the, the performance, that's not the, the big issue. I, I think a lot of people on the, the Twitterverse and in Reddit and Hacker News and wherever 
are always looking at memory consumption and how much memory is being used. And, you know, we, we do track and compare between like a hello world with Electron and a hello world with Tauri. And, you know, we find that the memory consumption is similar. Your boot time is similar. And a lot of that has to do with just the way that web views have been built and managed as adopted stray cats for the browser ecosystem. Okay. And the standards bodies are run by a lot of super intelligent people with vested interests, but there's no web view standard. You know, the way that, that Mac OS serves out their versions of the web view as opposed to how Windows is now doing it as opposed to the way that uh, WebKit GTK tries to do it across Linux platforms shows that everybody's just kind of trying to figure it out while they go. And because of this, you know, we see Towery Core at the moment kind of as a, a collection of ugly hacks and workarounds so we can get it to work. And we manage that and it, it is working, but in the long run, it's not really tenable. The big, the big performance issue that we have is the bridge. It's serialization. It's about passing data from one side to the other. There's no real shared memory between a front end and a back end in a web view. And where we're excited about working on Servo is rescuing this grand project this had such such lofty ideals and repurposing it such that we can get the performance back from the web view bridge by using shared memory and it'll be marginal it might be a little bit better than we're at right now maybe twice as fast maybe 10 times as fast in some cases but for me and i think for the team the most important features are the fact that it, it's secure and robust. And I mean, we, we still need benchmarks for the GL windowing that we're bringing out. I do expect that to be several orders of magnitude faster than a web view because it's just shader response. And yeah, I mean, why not performance? Hmm. Well, you talk about the environment too, right? Like in terms of you have in this 1.0 blog post, you have a full on table of, you know, how app size impacts the environment. But, you know, when we look at, I suppose, if Tari is planning to be or attempting to be what Electron could not get right because of Chromium and other, I guess, hurdles in its way to get to perfection is performance and every developer's issue with Electro when they cry on <laughs> Hacker News, Lobsters, wherever they go, is usually app size, which you've already talked about, but then also performance. It's like, well, I've got this application, but it runs slow. It loads slow. It's not a native app and I want native it, et cetera, et cetera. So performance seems to be the key thing. Well, see, that's exactly the thing. No, native apps. Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that that was a an attempt to throw mud in the face of uh, Cordova electron capacitor engineers, which is, yeah, your app runs so slow. You don't even get 60 frames per second. If you're running a list with a thousand elements and, and you know, that, that kind of performance, well, maybe we're sidestepping that because when you use the UI, the user interface, just to do user interface stuff, you've got lots of overhead. But if you're do, using it to do fetch and web sockets and, you know, keep your interface GUI and also do some kind of random intervals and you're all, you're stuck on this thread, maybe you've got a web worker. So if you're lucky, you've got two threads, but you're still sandboxed by the operating system. So at best, you're going to have two. Node.js might have one or two, but with Towery in the Rust core, just take all the threads you need. Mm. If you need to do thousands of computations to the nth position of tau or pi, 
I wonder which app would be faster. I, we might make that challenge on Twitter mm. when this uh, when this changelog podcast comes out. Let me get one. Let's let's do a battle. Yeah, Tau battle. So a lot of people would want to use Towery at this point simply because they're going to get that two megabyte to five megabyte binary, right? I mean, I would. And a lot of electron apps are like very little electron. It's just like the corners of the edges that you need. You know, maybe you have like a menu bar app. I mean, a lot of, especially dev tools, right? Like we're scratching our own itch. I would love this to be a menu bar across platform. Maybe I have a little bit of code that runs and I throw in Electron and it's a menu bar app now. And that's great, except for it's like a 500 megabytes or my menu bar app. There's a lot of, a lot of bloat there that could be avoided. What do, are people porting to Towery? What does it look like to port? Etc. Well, it, it really depends on how dependent you are on uh, on Electron. Well, let's just get, take that simple case of like I'm using it to help shim into the menu bar my otherwise CLI kind of style tool that's like you know shelling out and stuff. I mean, well, how much is there? Jumping into a menu bar is probably going to require you to write a little bit of Rust. Okay, menuing and uh, and that kind of task bar interaction is. Still a little complicated, but mm-hmm. absolutely doable. The interesting thing that we've heard from a couple projects is they've been using Rust to write their Node.js libraries. You know, so they use the NAPI and they render their Rust out and then they consume the NAPI in their JavaScript and their Electron app. And they were like, oh, this is great. I can just skip this compilation step and instantly consume my Rust that I've already written and know very well. And I have one less breakpoint. And it absolutely does work that way. And Mm. for trivial apps like, you know, a a, a word a day app that is literally just some HTML, CSS, and JS, you can take that entire rendered uh, dist folder or whatever and point the Towery build command at it. And if you're not doing anything funky, you're done. And you didn't even have to really touch a line of rust. Mm -hmm. Nice. Maybe a different word, a different version of Jared's question might be, where is the sweet spot? If someone is porting, what kind of app could be ported or Greenfield that's like sweet spot for Tally right now? We're seeing a couple different groups of projects come together. Developer tooling is is great, especially if you're consuming something remote over a WebSocket or something. People people can do that. You can use the WebSockets in the front end or the back end of Tally. It just depends on your your side. Security focused things like password managers are interested and in actually using uh, Towery right now. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention them. They're a sponsor on your website. So maybe we could mention them and you can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah. You don't have to say anything <laughs> if that's not, people won't get you trouble. I will say one of our most popular episodes was a rebroadcast of a show about them being all in on their web stacks. I mean, that's true. Mm-hmm. What they're doing around the web stack is very interesting to many. Well, I'm I, I'm hesitant to name any kind of names, but you know things that are developer tools that are utility tools. Uh, we saw somebody make a Twitch stream subtitle plugin system for OBS, for example. Mm. So I think the the sweet spot are apps where you might have to do something like cryptography, or you might have to do something with general low-level access or where you really want to have granular file permissions, because I think we do that pretty well. Like the, the easiest way to get started if you're a Node.js developer is really literally just to NPX create Tauri app. And uh, it'll tell you that you still have to install Rust if you haven't installed Rust yet. And then... It'll compile away after you, you know, set up the npm run dev command or whatever, and you'll have it up and running. So I think the neat part about it is just the diversity. I, I, it's hard to say. We, we have started our awesome Towery repo on GitHub, and every couple of days a new project floats on in, and it's just like, oh. Hmm. What about if the app is like, wants to be your digital HQ? and maybe transform the way you work with one place for everyone and everything you need to get stuff done, like maybe slack.com. 
Oh, wow. Slack. Um, as an experiment at one time, we did embed Slack.com into a Tauri app and it worked. But I also know that, that Slack is a deep believer in Electron and for good reason, because uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful user experience. I think amongst the 10 chat applications that I have, it's kind of the most well thought out. Mm. I do appreciate their user experience. They have a lot of deep integrations. So you have a lot yeah. of file access stuff. You have a lot of notifications, you know, like operating system level notifications. The kind of places where I think that cross-platform apps usually fall down is like in the tighter way. Like there's two ways that we think about native apps, perhaps. One of them is performance. Like, oh, that's native. It's fast. You were talking about the scrolling, right? But the other one is like, how much does it feel like the other apps on your system? And how much does it have those native dialogues or those native file pickers or et cetera? And I'm wondering where Towery is with those kinds of features, those kind of integrations into the platforms. For a Mac and Windows, it's native, native windowing. So you can also modify it if, you know, on Mac OS, you've got this little stoplight at the top and then the title of the app. And that's just kind of the generic app Chrome. Mm. But you can remove that. You can make the entire window transparent if you want. Uh, you can make it always on top. Uh, you can, which actually isn't something that Mac does that much, but mm -hmm. the, the file picker, uh, the directory picker, that's just native NS elements. Tabs, native tabbing, native uh, preferences. Yeah, we we are integrating with the uh, system light and dark mode, so you're able to do that kind of deep insight into, or not deep insight, but uh, you know this kind of expected user experience where right. if they're on a dark mode, then the app registers that it's in a dark mode and can pass that down to the user interface. This this native talk really reminds me of like applications or maybe even particular developers, you know, individual or conglomerate, you know, whether it's a small team or not, they choose, let's say, for example, things. They're pretty much Mac OS only. And I, and I wonder sometimes if it's just because it's been super difficult to multi-platform. And so it's easier in some cases just to be, I care so much or we care so much about, you know, native look and native speed and native whatever, you know, all these native things that make it feel like this is, this is Mac only, you know. And some of that might be it's just hard to multi-platform or they're just so focused on macOS for whatever the reasons are. History question. Does Windows 7 have native notifications? <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> it does not. No idea. It does not. Okay. And I think, you know, if, if we look back to the past yeah, 10 years of operating system evolution, on the one hand, you have like this mass exodus from a style in the Linux community where not only do you have a, you know, a driver uh, for your screen, X11 was very popular for a while, but I heard it's being dropped. Okay. So you've got the, the, the driver. Then you have the user interface, you know, maybe it's GNOME, maybe it's KDE, maybe it's, it's something else. Now, each of these apps have different understandings of what the desktop does or not apps, but have, you know, these kind of GUIs and different ways of registering them. And then in some of them, they don't even like you to have a taskbar anymore. And what, what we've discovered along the way working inside of the, the Linux ecosystem is that the matrix of things that you have to understand about that entire ecosystem in order to make a multi-platform Linux app is mind boggling. Even are you going to use app image or ship deb? What about arch users? How do you get it to them? And it becomes this practice of finding the least worst compromise, I guess. And Windows, thankfully, they, they've, believe it or not, built WebView 2 on top of Chromium. Yay. But what Windows finally did, I think what they do better than all of the others, you know, WebKit, WK WebKit from Mac and WebKit GTK from the Linux community, is they have a rolling evergreen release mm -hmm. so that you can constantly just subscribe to that and your system will keep the WebView 2 up to date. And you can 
as a developer, say, nope, it's this version and I'm shipping this version with you. Eat the 30 megabytes. <laughs> but mm. you, you have those options as, as a developer. And mm -hmm. to come back to your question about why is multi-platform so hard, it's because it's just different user experience dialects and mm -hmm. different source, different ecosystem requirements. Uh, I mean, on Mac, we can't go back in time before 10.13. I don't know how long it's going to be until Mac just says, all right, you guys, anyone who's still using Intel is out of the game. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we definitely have a fractured ecosystem. So how do we even notarize Mac apps if they just deprecate the whole architecture? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'd be sad because I do have some Intel machines lying around that I keep using that are still useful to me. I mean, it's got to be five, ten years away because there's a lot of machines that are out there right now. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason why I brought things in particular and, and this idea of like the difficulty to multi-platform is like, does Towery and Electron has promised this, but some, some just don't go down that road, but does Towery enable teams like things, for example, to go beyond Mac? Cause there is obviously a market share of people who want to do to do lists. I mean, I love things. I'm a user of them. That's why I'm mentioning them. Cause it's just got a phenomenal user experience on mobile and on the de desktop. And I don't use other well-known to do apps because their experience from one version to the next doesn't match. Things has been focused on that. And I'm just wondering, does Towery enable a team like that to e more easily, in quotes, more easily multi-platform? I would like to think so, but I don't know. I don't know things tech stack. Right. Spe specific things. Yeah. Did, did they use Cocoa they or Sync and stuff like that? Yeah. yeah. It's been around a long time. They've put a lot of engineering effort into focusing on this platform, getting it right. And they've probably gone through iterations where they're like, oh no, what do you mean? WebKit, whatever is gone now. And I mean, maybe they're not even using the WebKit. Maybe they're just like 100% metal these days. Maybe they don't use Objective-C. Maybe they do. Maybe they're writing in Swift. I think once you start down a path, that's kind of where we, what we mean with Brownfield. Once you start down a path, you kind of set your, you set your limits. And what I think Adam Shell and Electron and Node WebKit have done is they've allowed engineers to kind of hedge their bets because now you can, for the most of your code, take it from Electron and move it to Towery or move it to somebody else who does something similar. Neutralino, for example. It's, it's the HTML, JS, and CSS that you care about, and then you just have to glue it together with a backend. And what that does is it allows your architectural debt to sort of resolve itself as a new technology comes along, you can take the stuff that you've been building and port it over. And yeah, I think that it has a lot to do with the team. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. Mm -hmm. What about other platforms? There are other platforms. I notice you guys don't call yourself a desktop solution anywhere that I can see on the main website because, well, I wonder if that's because there's other platforms that you have planned, such as these mobile devices that we all know and love so well. Yes. Uh, we actually have prototypes of iOS and Android working already. Nice. Uh, we've, we've been waiting until the 1.0 landed in order to bring them kind of more to the forefront. The place where they exist is in one of those three libraries that we talked about in Tau and Rai. So we can do windowing. We can communicate with them. And now we have to raise them up to the, the Towery layer where they then interact with the APIs that you need, like the file system, the camera, the Bluetooth, and then also create the final APK or Apple blob and get those onto the app stores. So it's very early days for that. We're also interested in getting the apps on other devices. I remember when Gosh, when was it? This was a year or two ago when one of SpaceX's rockets went up and somebody mentioned that window, isn't that Electron? And it turns out they were using Electron on the rocket ship. And I think that, you know, okay, it's a, 
a nice dream to have, but <laughs> as and if our civilization keeps on progressing, I do expect us to start being able to ship apps to other devices like augmented reality and to watches and to your smart TV and even to embedded systems. I mean, one of the the neat parts about Tauri is that you can use it as a as a CLI. You can interact with it f- from the perspective of a CLI. You can hook apps up together so that they're communicating in a distributed way. And I think as people start to realize, okay, we can think about these applications, these devices that we're using as, we can still think of them as thick clients, right? It's not like it's just a dumb screen and a keyboard. These things have amazing processing power and we can, you know, reduce these requirements of putting our data into corporate silos. And that's where the privacy comes back in, Mm -hmm. right? By allowing people to own their own data, to own their own identities, to manage their own things because their devices are capable of it. Maybe that destroys some business models, but I think that for a, a growing type of engineer, it just makes more sense. Like why would you, pay for a cluster of highly available database servers and some API endpoints behind a, a CDN or when when you can just have the apps talk to each other. You just have to negotiate a point where they can meet and they can send all their data. Why, why bother having databases when you can trust your users? Uh-huh. And that might be the final paradigm shift that we're after. This episode is brought to you by Sourcegraph. With the launch of their Code Insights product, teams can now track what really matters in their code base. Code Insights instantly transforms your code base into a queryable database to create visual dashboards in seconds. And I'm here with Joel Kortler, the product manager of Code Insights for Sourcegraph. Joel, the way teams can use Code Insights seems to pretty much be limitless, but a particular problem every engineering team has is tracking versions of languages or packages. How big of a deal is it actually to track versions for teams? Yeah, it's a big deal for a couple of reasons. The first is, of course, just compatibility. You don't want things to break when you're testing locally or to break on your CI systems or test systems. You need to have some sort of level of like version unification and minimum version support, and all of that needs to be you know, compatible forward. But the other thing we learned was that for a lot of customers, especially you know, engineering organizations that are pretty established, they have older versions of things or even older versions of like SaaS tools they don't use anymore that they haven't fully removed because they're like not sure if it's still in use or they you know lost focus on that. And they're spinning up old virtual machines that they're still paying for. Or they're using you know old SaaS subscriptions they're afraid to cancel because they're not sure if anyone's actually using it. And so getting off of those versions not just like saves you the headaches and the risks and the vulnerabilities of being on old versions, but also literally the money of you know older systems running more slowly or the build times or you know virtual machines and SaaS tools that you're no longer using before you had this ability, we talked to teams, there are basically three ways you could do this. You could slack a million people and ask for just like an update point in time. You could have sort of one human and one spreadsheet where like it's somebody's job every Friday or every two weeks to just like search all the code and find all the versions and write it down in a Google sheet. Or there were a couple of companies that I came across with in-house systems that were sort of complicated. You had to know, you know, maybe Kotlin, but you didn't know Kotlin. But if you wanted to use this system, you had to learn Kotlin and you'd have to sort of build the whole world from scratch and run basically a tool like this with a pretty steep learning curve. And now for all three of those, you could replace it with a single line source graph search, which is basically just the name of the thing you're trying to track and the version string in the right format. And then we have templates that'll help you get started if you're not sure what that format is. And then it'll automatically track all the different versions for you, both historically. So even if you start using it today, you can see your historical patterns. And then of course, going forward. Very cool. Thank you, Joel. So right now there is a treasure trove of insights just waiting for you living inside your code base right now. Teams are tracking migrations, adoption deprecations. They're detecting and tracking versions of languages and packages. They're removing or ensuring the removal of security vulnerabilities. They understand their code by team. They can track their code smells and health, and they can visualize configurations and services and so much more with Code Insights. A good next step is to go 
to about.sourcegraph.com slash code dash insights. See how other teams are using this awesome feature. Again, about.sourcegraph.com slash code dash insights. This link is in the show notes. And by our friends at Retool. Retool helps teams focus on product development and customer value, not building and maintaining internal tools. It's a low-code platform built specifically for developers. No more UI libraries, no more hacking together data sources, and no more worrying about access controls. Start shipping internal apps that move your business forward in minutes with basically zero uptime, reliability, or maintenance burden on your team. Some of the best teams out there trust Retool, Brex, Coin base plaid doordash legal genius amazon allbirds peloton and so many more the developers at these teams trust retool as their platform to build their internal tools and that means you can too it's free to try so head to retool.com slash changelog again retool.com slash changelog Daniel, there's, I'm sure, a, a mounting amount of people listening to the show now, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people, who knows, curious about the future of multi-platform native application development. And with Tar, what's the first step? You got some prerequisites. Rust is a prerequisite. Pretty easy from there, right? But then you've got... Actually, that's the only prereq. You can do your entire app in Rust uh, if you want to run all of the Tauri commands. You can use the, the Rust version of NPM, Yarn, PMEM. It's called Cargo. Generally speaking, the majority of people will need Node.js uh, if they're doing something like, uh, you know, a front-end language like Svelte or Vue or whatever. And depending on your development platform, you're probably going to need some other tooling. Chances are good that you already have it installed, but uh, if you don't, we we walk you through the the couple things that you might need. Basically, at the end of the day, you need a C compiler because we still use Rust. Still uses uh, you know, there's a couple ways to do it, but GCC, for example, is uh, pretty common. And yeah, then you're good to go. You need a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have oh, somebody yes. trying to develop Towery apps on Android and kind of didn't work that well. You can develop headless. Uh, there's ways to test with XVFB on Linux, so you can kind of emulate a screen. But generally speaking, yeah, a keyboard, uh, an IDE, and like a development environment, a lot of people use VS Code, VS Codium, uh, you know, ch take your pick. As long as you can edit some code, you might want to have Git installed. Uh, it's not a requirement, but modern engineering is kind of moving toward that distributed collaboration. It's what we use, mm -hmm. but not a requirement. So, I mean, the, the easiest way to get started is uh, probably for a lot of people, I would say the majority is going to be in the, the Node.js ecosystem. So pick your favorite framework and we probably have a starter kit for you. So you can run the create Tauri app, which is a, a library that we built in Node.js that scaffolds up your entire folder structure. So you get your, you know, if, if you're using React or Svelte or whatever, you get all of those node modules that you need to set it up and you get a dev server that, uh, that you then use to get your hot module reloading while you're developing the app. And yeah, that's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We've tried pretty hard to get it to work for almost everybody. I think we're at parity now between the three majors, you know, Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. And then, you know, you're going to want to build your app. And what we've found is bundling for all the platforms is complicated and that has a lot to do with the way the compiler expects the architecture to work and you know rust you can compile rust for a, a number of different platforms but where it always 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 gets sticky is compiling for mac os so 
Some people run a couple virtual machines. They maybe have a, a Mac OS as a, a main driver, and then they run a Linux and a Windows virtual machine, or they have a Linux uh, as their main, and then they run a suite of virtual machines. And as a matter of fact, that's kind of how the CI works. So the Tau reaction on GitHub that you can really easily hook into your GitHub workflow basically takes your Tau reconfiguration file, which tells it, you know, what kind of app you want to build for Mac, for Windows, for Linux, so, you know, what kind of uh, API features you want to embed into the system because you know, you're using them or you don't want to embed the kind of CSP security policy that you want. You know, there's, there's a, a lot of granular functionality inside of that configuration file. And it's actually all the CI really needs at the end of the day to build out for those other platforms. And, you know, I think that's kind of the skinny, the lowdown on, on what you, you need to, to consider when you want to build for multiple platforms. How do you test those integrations? How do you test? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. The age old question that sucks to answer. It, it, it is, a, it is a sucky question. Um, but <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's really, really, really important that, uh, you know, you unit test the code that you've written. Sure. But how do you integrate, you know, and what we've built is a early version of a web driver IO based protocol called Tauri driver. So you can drive Windows and Linux and basically test that if somebody wants to spawn a child window and clicks a button that you can prove that that action actually works via normal web driver IO stuff. And because it's web driver IO, you get all of the other goodies that the ecosystem offers, uh, you know, visual regression testing, if that's your jam or, I've seen even a B stuff work where we do need help. And if you're listening, dear listenership help with the Mac OS integration of that. Cause we just, <laughs> we just couldn't get that to work with GUI apps. I know that, um, you know, for example, Cypress does an amazing job of, you know, the way you set up your Cypress tests and the way that it runs through them and it clicks through your user interface, those are really, it's really great for websites, for web apps. And you can actually leverage a lot of that thinking in Towery apps. So you can also run tests on your browser code. Certain things that have to hook into Towery APIs, well, you got to mock them. Uh, that's how, that's how that game works. And we do provide a plugin that helps you mock. And at the end of the day, uh, if you're serious about it, you have a QA team and they're on each of the platforms that are important to you. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the reality on the ground ever says that it's just okay to do automated testing. I think without users giving you feedback on what you thought was a thing that was working <laughs> is really important, especially because the guys and girls and folks and people writing the code, sure, they can write the tests, but they can't quality assure. That's, you, you just always have these blind spots. I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent and I'm not trying to avoid the question. Mm. The answer is... Uh, well, you answered the question, I think, as well as you can. You, you test uh, in Rust just like you test in JavaScript. You write your units and you mock what you have to and you build integration tests and you do QA. Mm. Mm -hmm. Normal software engineering, I guess. Is there any towery specific debugging stuff? Or is it just, again, the same answer as like, well, how do you debug in Rust? How do you debug in JavaScript? You know, there's a really amazing learning tool for Rust called Rustlings. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, go to GitHub, track it down, clone it, run it in your IDE. And the way Rustlings works is it gives you chapters of broken code. And the Rust compiler, say what you will about Rust mutability, about borrowing, about streams, about the complexity of the deep magic involved in unsafe code. What it does have that I wished 
I discovered somewhere a decade ago is a compiler that really tries really hard to help you. If it finds a mistake, it'll be like, well, you know, you've got a mistake here. You can't cast this to that. And it, it shows you like with a explainer text that you can call up and read about. So the compiler helps you. And what I find or found hard at the beginning of Rust was, you know, overcoming my deep of how mutability worked and I didn't have it at the time. And, and now what I, what I really enjoy is finding out new parts of Rust that I didn't know existed before. So the compiler is your friend. That's, that's what people do for debugging. Mm -hmm. And in the near future, soon, trademark, whatever, uh, we are building static analysis tools to help users, developers for applications, discover where they can improve we have this notion of an accept list and the accept list basically in the configuration file tells the Tauri bundler which parts of the Rust API it should embed in the application. And if you don't know what you're doing, it's easy to just uh, accept list the entire API, which makes your app about 1.5 megabytes bigger because it's just extra stuff that you don't know you need because it's very granular. And what we're looking forward to doing is introspecting in the code to find ways for you to improve your security, but also your footprint. And I know it's not exactly the same as debugging, but from the perspective of wanting to help people ship better software, these assumptions of it's free real estate are things that I think are a bug. Hmm. So the sense that I'm getting, and I want you to like true or false this or Tell me if my sense is off. It sounds like at this point, the promise is somewhat like you don't have to write any rust, but the reality is kind of like, yeah, you're probably going to be writing a lot of rust. Is that wrong? Or is that, is that on? Just for expectation setting. You do not have to write any rust code. Absolutely. If you don't, if everything is web driven, web interface driven, and you're comfortable with the APIs that we offer you, you don't have to write any rust. If you want to integrate a shiny library from the Rust ecosystem or write your own uh, for perfect random number generation or something, then, you know, you, you have to learn a little bit of Rust. And I think, and, and this is something we were actually talking about in the working group today, it's not just me. We think that because you don't need to write Rust from the beginning, you can make your entire app this way just by you know, using the APIs that you consume and writing a configuration file in JSON, mm -hmm. it lowers the barrier to entry because you can say you have now built a Rust-based application. And just being able to say this is kind of one of those visualization techniques of getting better at things, is understanding that, yes, you are capable of doing it. And the fact is people get interested by it. Like over the, the three years we've been working on this project, a couple people have very visibly improved in their rust. At the beginning, they're like, this is hard. Everything is hard if you've never done it before. And having Tauri as a gateway to understanding, well, okay, I need a compiler. Why do I need a compiler? Well, having a compiler is good because it makes my app small. Great. So you get that out of the way. And then you discover that, oh, maybe there's this special custom feature that you want to make and you follow the instructions and you write a couple lines of Rust and the compiler's like, oh, you did it wrong. And you're like, oh, okay, what did I do? Oh, that's what I did wrong. And you figure it out and suddenly you've written a couple lines of Rust. So I, I see Tauri and, and projects like Tauri that offer an easy access to a complicated language paradigm as a definite win, not only for people who want to learn Rust, but also for those advanced projects that absolutely need Rust engineers, suddenly we're able to provide a marketplace for Rust engineers to go out and get jobs. Okay, maybe not suddenly. Mm -hmm. It might take a few months. We just got the 1.0, mm -hmm. but I think that it's, uh, it's definitely 
a way forward. It's a way to grow as an engineer. You mentioned before, teased, I, I should say, other platforms. What's the state of WASM as it is to Tari? What's the future? Yeah, coming soon on the homepage, though. So. WASM and WASI are ultra exciting. The concern I generally have with WASM in the browser has to do with the linear memory space of WASM and the fact that up until now, as far as I know, it still exists in the global scope. So any kind of security isolation that you thought you had, you don't really have. Where we're going to be going with WASM first and foremost is providing a WASM-ish interface for WASM projects to interact with. One of them that's kind of common or might have heard of is called U, Y-E-W. Another one is Dominator. And these are basically projects that are Rust native, which means you write your entire user interface in Rust and that gets rendered out to WASM. And the problem that those projects have right now is that it's very difficult for them to interact with the JavaScript API from WASM. So that's actually the very first step down that road. And we have always wanted to branch out into other languages. And what I, what I mean by that is, yes, the core is written in Rust. We plan and want to continue offering further interfaces to Tauri. In one of our examples on the main repo, we have a... Uh, a di I don't know how to say this, DUI lib uh, that allows you to harness Tauri core from C. And where I think that's going to be able to go in the not so distant future is offering the same type of interface to a WASI environment. So I guess the thing to think about is what is the target of the WASM blob, right? If it's going to be targeting the browser, the browser has a, a much different permission scope than a Tauri app does by nature. So rendering a Tauri app as WASM might make sense in some circumstances, such as you maybe want to make a, a spa or a website from the same app. But at that point... I think we're still in the discussion phase about how much sense that makes. I mean, if you think about it, you're building a web app using web tech such as Vue or Svelte, and then you're putting that into a Tauri app that you want to then turn into WASM so you can put back in the browser. Why not just cut Tauri out entirely? Mm -hmm. uh, so like for us, the, the, the interesting sides of WASM are the use cases for the pure WASM community and also looking forward to the WASI approaches that allow you to just run anywhere in any context. What's the best place or way to become part of the Towery community? Is there a place y'all hang? Is there a forum or a Discord or a Slack HQ? There is a Electron app known as Discord that you can download. You can also put it on your phone. Uh, as I think that's a it's a capacitor. There's no app. Tauri app for this, and that's where you can come and get involved in the research and behind Tauri core and plugins and get involved that way. You can also come and ask questions in one of the other channels about problems you might have. And if you like it and you stick around and maybe you file some pull requests and file some issues and start getting, getting involved in the actual making of Tauri, chances are good that one of the people in the working group might reach out to you and be like, Hey, you're pretty awesome. Do you want to get more involved? And that's our flat hierarchy. <laughs> Basically, the way that works is we have a core team of uh, a number of people who 
are the the wardens, the the gardeners of the project. Make sure that you know when we cut a release, it has to be done by one of them. But by joining the working group, you would then get GitHub repo access to all the public repos, and you can work on a branch instead of a fork, which, believe it or not, improves security. And you can uh, participate in the strategic discussions and the WTF channels and hang out and, and work together. And we're super open. Uh, if, if you get involved, uh, you're part of the working group and we want to know about it and, and bring you on board. And I think that that low barrier to access is also a reason why we have such an amazing group of, of dedicated people who spend weekends and afternoons uh, telling people uh, how to do things and at the same time building great stuff. So if uh, if our listeners are listening and are getting excited about the future of of where this is going, what, what can you share about the organization? You mentioned before venture capital. Maybe there's a company. Maybe there's some things happening. And if they're going to invest in their time in building something, they want to build it on a strong foundation. So describe the direction of what you're doing and how the organization is forming, not so much if there's venture capital or not, but like what's happening company-wise to keep the core team involved, keep people around, keep the project and the idea sustainable. So we have a board of directors uh, that get together to make strategic decisions about things like, do we get a trademark? How do we deal with uh, managing the community? What about the the book? How is that deal going to work? Who gets how much finance? Then uh, we have the core team, which is, uh, like I said, a, a number of people who have massively contributed to the project and are involved in the day-to-day the -day decision making. And then we have a, another volunteer group called the working group. And basically the way that our organization makes decisions is by consensus. So if there's a veto, then we talk it out. Uh, if there's not a veto, then we discuss the, the best way forward. Uh, for example, right now we're having a multi-day discussion about our future release strategy. Now that we've gotten 1.0 behind us, how do we do, deal with new features? How are we going to integrate the auditors? Do we call something a beta or an RC? And how often are we going to release a major? The, the reason why we even got audited in the first place is because we're going to continuously be audited. And I think that if someone is getting interested in Towery right now, it's a great time to find out what we've built and know that the stuff that we've built up until now has been proven to be as secure as possible and is backed by a team of people who really deeply care about the project. We have been accepting donations from over at Open Collective, excuse me, and some organizations find the, the project useful and, and make regular donations. Others uh, are personal donors. And we use this money for things that are project relevant, like you know, paying for the audit or the trademark or for deciding on no, we didn't ever do travel costs. We've kept it lean, but that budget has also been really small. And so in the discussions around forming a company, what, what we've realized is that, sure, up until now, for the past three years, it's been working really, really well on the backs of volunteers, which is almost the same as the instrumentalization of the precariat where people have time on weekends and evenings and sacrifice social time in the real world. And then maybe they get new jobs or they have to move and they just don't focus anymore. And, mm -hmm. you know, 
our documentation needs lots and lots of attention. And how do you manage a documentation project of that scope just with volunteers? So we, we've, we've really come to the conclusion that in order for us to continue sustaining the community, we need to find a means by which we can employ members of the core team. We can employ members from the community and people who are interested in uh, getting involved in Tauri. And, you know, that's the delicate balance of how do you create a common good while still participating in a capital market? It's a, it's, it's a really intriguing concept to, to even think about because when you say the value of our company isn't in what we're doing, it's in what other people are doing with us, like it's hard for financial people to, to really wrap their head around and, and grok and be like, yeah, that makes sense, man. <laughs> and and at, at the same time, uh, if, uh, you know, if, if we don't continue getting donations for, you know, paying for one or two full-time roles, you know, if that money were to dry up, people would have to start looking for other jobs and the evolution of the project would stall. So, you know, in order to continue providing that common good and doing it in the right way is going to be a very delicate dance. But if you've been listening, you'll remember that not even the core team can change the license of the code. There's no rug pull possible here because we put the code at such a privileged central point of the project that, you know, the, the only things that we could even really consider offering are, are, are things that are built around Tauri. There's, there's no way for us to open core it. There's no way for us to even legally gut it. it it's owned by a foundation in Holland called the, the Commons Conservancy. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's, it's challenging to talk about. And I know that there are amazing open source projects out there that, that have succeeded and we're taking inspiration from them. But at the same time, the promise that we made to ourselves when we made an open source project is that it stays open source. We're not going to weaponize it because we don't believe in your war. We're not going to, you know, delete the code from NPM because we don't believe in your police. Like, I, I think that the greatest satisfaction that you can have as an open source software engineer is that somebody is using your code and enjoying it and contributing back. And that contribution back can simply be by building an app using it. Uh, filing issues, filing, filing pull requests, mm -hmm. making donations, that's, that's all really great. But the mere fact that it's being used is is why open source exists. Now, we can get into the morality of what it means to be an honorable human being and a gentle person who cares for their environment and their fellow beings. We can talk about that. But that's why you have other instruments. That's why you have a community. You can take people out of your community if you don't like them. But open source, is it's become more than a license. But at the end of the day, that's what it really is. And so we have an agreement with the community and with each other that this project is open source and it's staying open source. And I mean, those are, those are the arguments that I, I would bring to the table, that it's a, a stable core, it's been audited, and it is and always will be open source. Yeah. And we're working really hard on finding an honorable way to support the engineers involved in building it. Well, you've really thought through a lot of stuff here. You got a great community behind you. You've got great, uh, you know, great ideals in place in terms of how you're running the project. So this is all good things to build a foundation for this project on. So appreciate you sharing your time here today, and it's been awesome. That's it. The show's done. What do you think about this big next step in web tech, in multi-platform, in Tiny. Towery is doing some cool stuff. Check it out if you haven't already. 
and let us know in the comments. We want to hear from you. Links are in the show notes. If you dig what we're doing with this show, I think you might because you're listening to it. Thank you, by the way. You might enjoy other pods we have in the Change Law Podcast universe. For fans of my show, Fighters Talk, I recently talked to Jack Dorsey. Yes, CEO of Square, former CEO of Twitter. And Jack shared with me what it means to be a hacker. Take a listen. One of the interesting things around punk rock is like, you know, someone gets up there first time with a band and they're absolutely terrible. And then you see them the next month and they get a little bit better. And you see them two months after that and they're really good and then they get great and um just being able to like create in public and make your mistakes in public i saw the same sort of attitude and approach in um on the internet and open source software where you're not you're a terrible programmer and you put something out there and and you get feedback and it's usually super negative feedback and you know um angry people behind keyboards but it gets you into a better state It, it helps you learn um and you learn from others just by watching their work and watching what they're doing and, and what mistakes they're making. The the other thing of hacker to me means like you do whatever it takes to make it work. I, yeah. I was not an engineer. I would never an engineer. Um, I just don't have the skill for that. An engineer being someone who actually can make something work, but also it be stable and scalable and um, and be fail safe. Um, I learned enough to make the thing work barely work and it would probably fall down at some point so i wrote all the original code for square uh back then and it was quickly replaced by people who could actually make a scale although i thought mine was pretty good (laughs) in this case all right continue listening to that pod at founderstalk.fm slash 91 that's episode 91 big thanks once again to our friends and partners at fastly they provide our super fast global CDN. Check them out at fastly.com. And of course, big thanks to Breakmaster Cylinder. Our beats are banging. BMC makes banging beats, and we love them. Hope you love them too. All right, this show's done. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Bye.